me, good garbage is something that can go back into the earth and not really be garbage at the end of the day. We really just shouldn't be leaving things in the environment that aren't supposed to be in the environment. So, yeah, seeing that from a young age, I think, really kind of shaped a lot of the ways that I look at pollution and waste in general. Hello, hello. Welcome to the Good Garbage Podcast. My name is Veth Krishna. My primary reason for existence has been to find ways to leave our wonderful planet cleaner. We will be speaking with material innovators, creators, and propagators to learn from them how we can build for scale and towards a regenerative future. Their stories will help us answer the big question, what is good garbage? As we look towards leaving our planet cleaner, we need lots and lots of youngsters with fresh ideas joining in this movement. One such young entrepreneur is Dylan Baxter, who is the CEO of Plant Switch, and I get to speak to him today about all the work that Plant Switch is doing, uh, starting with using agave and then scaling up by using numerous other possibilities in the domain of compostable packaging and food service materials. Enjoy. We are so happy to have Dylan Baxter, the co-founder of Plant Switch, today with us. I'm really so happy to have you here, Dylan, and also really excited to learn from you. We work with a lot of things, but we haven't done agave so far. So excited to have you and thank you for joining us on this podcast. Thank you for having me. Definitely excited to be on. Uh, so as we start, usually, it's always good to know a person's personal journey and what got them to this place. And in particular, if you can think back to your childhood and think of how packaging made an impact on you and how it affected your choices later in life. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm born and raised in Texas, and I grew up in a small town in Texas called New Braunfels, um, which is a kind of a tourist destination in a way that there's rivers and a water park there. But one of the really big issues growing up that I remember pretty vividly was pollution in the rivers. Uh, there was a lot of kind of, that was kind of the main political issue of the town was, you know, bands around cans in the rivers and, you know, trying to clean up the rivers because summer would come around and kind of a sleepy-ish town um, at the time for the most part, but then summer would come around, a lot of tourists would come, float the river, you know, bring their 24 pack of beers and leave all the cans in the river. And then there became a lot of pollution. And so I remember from a young age, that was always a pretty contentious point. And it was just a weird thing for me. It was just seemed so obvious that you didn't want to leave trash in the river. And I couldn't understand really the other point of view there. And so I think that was kind of the first exposure that I had to pollution in general. And um, it definitely resonated with me that we really just shouldn't be leaving things in the environment that aren't supposed to be in the environment. So, yeah, seeing that from a young age, I think, really kind of shaped a lot of the ways that I look at you know, pollution and waste in general. Yeah, that's interesting because I grew up in an area which had beautiful marshlands and they slowly got taken over by the landfills. And it was so sad to see the birds go away and, and this just this beautiful, beautiful space become a land dump. Uh, so fast forward to your education, you are not, you did not choose environment or ecology as your education. You were educated in finance. As far as I know from my reading, uh, you were going into a, an absolute finance career and uh, then you sort of got sidetracked. So tell us about that journey. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I also played golf in college and, you know, that was my kind of original goal was to play professional golf. In high school, you know, originally I thought that I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to work on planes. Um, and so that was kind of my original passion. But then as I started talking to college golf programs, which was pretty much universally telling me you can't do engineering and golf at the same time, you know, it's too much of a course load. So choosing golf over engineering, it seemed like kind of the next best thing was finance. You know, you still get to work with numbers, which I've always been a pretty big numbers guy. And so around my sophomore, junior year, I started dealing with some injuries in my back and uh, focusing more on kind of the school and finance side of things. Um, I was working at investment banks and private equity internships the last few years of my college career and uh, actually had a full-time job at an investment bank um, once I graduated. But at one of the internships that I was at, uh, we were studying a bioplastic company, uh, or not studying, but you know, evaluating for investment. I was kind of the business development guy and the research guy as an intern. And so they had me do a deep dive on the industry and try to basically find out as much as I could. So that's where I got my initial exposure to it. And 
thought it was just fascinating. You know, I'd, I'd kind of had that background exposure to some pollution and it was just kind of just a weird thing to me. And then realizing, which I didn't know, that you could make plastic from plant-based inputs as opposed to petroleum-based inputs was a huge eye-opener. And it just seemed patently obvious that that was where the industry was going to go. Um, whether it's right now or whether it's 10 years in the future, eventually we're going to have to use something more sustainable than petroleum. So I was very excited by the industry, very passionate about you know what it was. I did think that just from a pure business and finance standpoint, that while a lot of the technology was very cool and useful from a sustainability aspect, it was kind of missing the point of competing with plastic at scale and the fact that the cost of production was just so prohibitively high. You know, from a business standpoint, it was like, I don't know if this makes sense the way that they're approaching it because it's so expensive. But from a personal standpoint, I was like, this makes perfect sense because we're going to have to replace plastic. That was really how that that interest got peaked. So looking at it from kind of that business standpoint, and then, you know, that's just kind of where the proclivity towards that industry started. Talk to us about your business partner, your co-founder, Maxim, because I think he played a big role as well in you guys deciding to do what you do. So tell us more about him and how you guys met and how did this partnership come together? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Maxim, my business partner and you know one of my best friends, like a brother to me, he played on the golf team with me at SMU and he was a few years older. So, um, you know, he was you know really great to me when I came in and we became pretty close He's from Martinique, which is an island in the French Caribbean. So he had seen, you know, a lot of ocean pollution, you know, had experienced firsthand plastic waste kind of ruining the beaches that he grew up on. And he moved to the U.S. when he was 15 to pursue his dream of playing golf. He played golf professionally. So he actually went overseas. He played uh, both in America and Europe professionally for a couple of years after graduating. And, you know, we kind of came together around, you know, end of 2019 and started talking about plant switch basically and it's been it's been a lot of fun working with him for sure and how did you come to the idea of agave and uh and and why why did that make sense to you yeah so uh, maxime his family has a distribution company in the caribbean and um you know he has access to uh, works with a lot of you know contract manufacturers throughout you know central and south america and so um, he actually had some connections to kind of various pieces of the supply chain that um, we're doing either plastics or fiber processing or bioplastics manufacturing. And so we were able to collaborate with a couple of them to get those products up and running. And um, it was just a really nice kind of entry point for us because we were able to work with people that had manufacturing experience that were contracting it out and that kind of knew how to do things like this. And did you study other substrates or was it just uh, you knew somebody who was using agave and making stuff and started working with them? Yeah, basically, basically. Um, so we just started working with them and, you know, it was kind of right on the verge of bringing it to the market. Um, we kind of specialized more in that sales, marketing and distribution piece and really getting that out into the market. You know, that's how we positioned ourselves and it was a really great way to get started. So talk to us about more about agave itself and uh, what is the part of that plant that is used? How is it converted? What is it converted into? And what are the other potentials that can be made from that, whatever the substrate is? Yeah, definitely. So really at the end of the day, it's just a kind of fibrous cellulosic feedstock. And agave is a great material, really high cellulose and, you know, very fibrous and strong. So it's a great feedstock. You know, with the same kind of technology, there's a lot of other feedstocks that can be used as well, um, as long as it falls in that same fibrous cellulosic category. And so... The agave is a great one because it's taking that waste product from tequila production. So you're upcycling that agro-industrial waste. So you can kind of feel good the next time you're drinking tequila that, you know, that waste is going somewhere positive, <laughs> which is nice. Yeah, I mean, I think the agave is a great material, great feedstock. Uh, some of the other ones that you can use with similar process um, that we've been developing, the hemp, the jute, flax, you know, anything along those lines, even sugar cane. There's a lot of agro-industrial waste out there that can be used for uh, bioplastics like this and you know the core component is as I mentioned that cellulose and that fiber. But when I at least look at pictures of your product especially your straws they're pretty translucent and they're pretty stiff. How does that happen because when I look at fibrous materials it's more cellulosic paper kind of situation and yours is not. Yours is yours is a stiffer bioplastic kind of substrate. What What is the process that enables that? Yeah for sure. Um, 
I can't disclose a, a ton about that, just kind of due to our relationships with our manufacturers and everything. So what I can say is, you know, a lot of it is just the, the ability to bind those cellulosic fibers with, with other existing polymers. Um, and that's kind of the, the magic of how you make it happen and really get those good mechanical properties. Are most of these made uh, around the U.S. or are you? Is there offshore manufacturing, and how does how does the supply chain work? Yeah, uh, it's mostly made in Mexico. You know, if you use that agave waste from Mexico and keep everything close together. It's pretty important that I think you keep supply chains close together, as we've seen, especially over the last couple of years. Um, you know, the more transportation, the more cost, and the more carbon footprint, and the more room for error. So, of course, we've seen the straws that you guys are bringing into the market what are the other products that are already being made and what is the other potentials that can be made from the same feedstock yeah yeah so as i mentioned we work with you know a variety of manufacturers and so you know at this point we're working with straws and cutlery we also have plates bowls and clamshells that are sourced from bamboo fiber and so that's a new product line we just launched that i'm particularly excited about super strong material very grease resistant all the good sustainability aspects as well, compostable, biodegradable, you name it. The other thing that's you know particularly exciting to me is what we've been developing for a while now, which is other ways and other cellulosic feedstocks that we can work with. Um, again, you know we work with some really talented people on on our team that have developed some some really cool things, and we're on the cusp of commercializing some of these things early next year. You know I can't share as much as I would like to at the moment, but. Basically, the goal is that we'll be able to create any type of plastic product and use that technology, not just to make food service items, but to make anything that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life, you know, an AirPods case or a, or a mouse or a phone case or anything like that. So the ability to kind of diversify into all these product lines, work with existing plastics manufacturers and go beyond just that food service scope with a really great material that's honestly pretty cost competitive to traditional plastics is something that I'm very excited about. That's super. I actually want to learn more about the products from Agave itself. Is that just the straw or is there other things that can be made from that product? Really anything injection molded kind of in that sweet spot of what can be made. You know, we have those forks and spoons and knives um, that are you know, great quality and we get great feedback on. And that same process technology, whether that's agave or whether that's one of those other similar feedstocks that I've mentioned that we've been working with, can be used to make injection molded parts and fairly straightforward, just can be used with existing plastic machinery. And so uh, that just makes it so much easier to scale. Oh, that's super. And uh, when you look at the compostability, of course, a straw is a much thinner substrate, so, so it would be easier to compost. But when we look at a cutlery product, it's stiffer. So, so how does that compare in terms of uh, the, the end of use? Does that compost relatively easily? Does it also get affected by the kind of binder you use? How does that equation play? You know, my goal is that we create a home compostable product. That's what we've really been working towards is developing home compostable technology. Um, you know, I think you really need something that you can throw in your backyard compost and it goes away, right? That's really the future of the product and that's what we're developing right now. I think that we'll have that probably commercialized early next year. And so that's what I think everything needs to be and the standard should be. And so I'm excited to have that type of technology ready. So the current products are not home compostable, they're industrially compostable? Yeah, not home compostable. Um, run the test on industrial uh, compostability as well as the simulated landfill degradability test. Um, I've seen good results on those. Um, that's great. But again, you know, I think a lot of America, unfortunately, doesn't have access to that industrial composting. I know us in Dallas, you know, we don't, we don't really have access to that. That's where I think it's, it's really important to get to that home compostability standard. And is that mostly to do with the binder that is being used? And is that what you would work on? Yeah, basically, basically. Happy to learn about the other products now. Talk to us more about, you mentioned bamboo. Uh, you mentioned some other substrates. Uh, in terms of bamboo, I presume it will be a different place to source those. Most of the bamboo products that I've seen may not be single use. They may be stiffer and, you know, could be used for a multiple use as well. Are you looking at those as well? Yeah, yeah. So right now we're working with a manufacturer out of China for the bamboo products and they make great product. We are looking to bring that, you know, into North South America, try to minimize that transportation and carbon footprint. Also looking at sugarcane 
Um, first version of the products, I'm sure we'll iterate from there. Right now, everything is kind of in our food service single use portfolio because that's you know where our customer base is. That's kind of our sweet spot right now. Um, as I mentioned, next year, we're going to be getting into a lot of different industries with uh, some of the new technology. And so uh, we're very excited about, about that. Some of the other industries that we talked about are the cosmetics industry, as well as the CPG industry. There's just so many products that are made from plastic, as you keep thinking about it, that can be made from a plant-based material. And so um, I think that we'll find a lot of traction in that cosmetics industry where sustainability has become a really big emphasis. Um, and then in the CPG as well, you know, every brand out there, it's some form of commitment to sustainability or net zero. I think, uh, I think being able to diversify and go into those other types of products is going to be really great for our brand. So when we uh, look at the, the bamboo or the sugarcane based stuff, there's a lot of people who are importing that kind of product. Uh, so how would you, how do you see yourself uh, differentiating plant switch and uh, adding value uh, into something that is already being done? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that's, again, on, you know, the new development of new technology that we've been working on. Um, you know, right now we're, we're using a product that is pretty similar to what's out there. And again, it's the first generation of it, right? So we have great customer service. We have great marketing relationships directly with our clients. And you know, since we've launched, people have always been asking us to add more to our portfolio. Um, this was our first attempt at really doing that, at trying to bring more of a one, one-stop shop food service portfolio in-house. So again, you know, we, the, the products that we have, we're, we're really happy with, and they're very high quality, great products. And we're in the process of developing, you know, what we think will be even more differentiated technology than what we currently have. And continuing to add to our portfolio is one of our big value props to our customers, because, you know, we really just try to be the best distributor, essentially, that they've ever worked with. And how do you, so a big part of the business model seems to be to identify good suppliers. How do you go about doing that? Because again, I've traveled a lot in China myself, and there's so many amazing suppliers actually, and they've been working with numerous countries. They know how the business works. It's difficult to decide which one. And uh, how do you go about doing that? And then how do you build a deeper relationship uh, with them? Yeah, uh, it's just communication, I think, you know. We talk to a lot of different potential suppliers and, you know, there's varying levels of being forthcoming and, you know, transparency. And so um, I think the more that they're willing to engage with you and have that constant dialogue open, the better the relationship is going to be. And so um, as we evaluate suppliers, that's really the main thing that we look for. You know, do you understand our needs? Are you going to be transparent with us? Are you going to have that open dialogue with us? If they can check all those boxes and kind of prove that out over a shorter initial pilot phase, then that's when we feel comfortable to start adding more of the supply chain allocation to them. Um, as I mentioned, you know, this is the first generation of the products, trying to get it out there, prove the fit and the concept, and then um, continue iterating from there. So, you know, there's varying levels again of, you know, the, the paperwork, the documentation. If it's if that's not there, that's a pretty big red flag. It's not some, someone that we're going to work with. Uh, we make sure that they kind of have their full suite of documentation, certifications, paperwork, you know, done all the way through. And um, if they can check all those boxes, that makes me feel comfortable. We also, you know, do usually a test order on a very small basis, check all the products, do our own testing, make sure that they're legit. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of ways that we kind of verify the product other than just getting boots on the ground. Are you, are you bringing in generic designs as well right now, or are you giving them specific designs to be manufactured for Plant Switch, or is that going to come in the next generation? Yeah, it's Plant Switch branded right now, just using existing molds. And then uh, again, we're working on you know, our own custom molds, our own custom feedstocks, you know, iterations to the product. And so, um, you know, everything that we do, I, I kind of view as first gen right, right now. Um, you know, we're a young company and, you know, we needed to prove product market fit. Coming from that finance background, you know, I didn't, I didn't really see the logic in raising a ton of money before I'd sold anything to a customer. You know, I wanted to get the product out on the market, prove the fit, prove the traction that we knew what we were doing and how to grow it, and then develop the technology alongside that. And it's also really great when you're developing technology and getting constant feedback from a customer. You know, we have customers that we work with where every time we do an iteration, we're sending them that iteration and getting feedback constantly. And I think that's a you know, very important thing to do in this space because 
if you don't, you're kind of shooting in the dark, right? Like you may think that something is great, but the customer may not. And if the customer doesn't, that's the only thing that really matters. So um, we take a much different approach, I think, than some companies that just want to raise a ton of money, develop a full IP portfolio, build a full manufacturing facility, and then hope that the customers like it. You know, that's not the way that we operate. Everything that we do is customer first, and we have that benefit of talking to the customer every single day um, and getting their feedback all the time. So we do everything with that in mind, and that's why we focus on things like cost, like quality, um, marketing, you know, ready availability of products, you know, all those things that we get the feedback from them of them wanting. Those are the things that we really prioritize in our business. And then our technology follows that trend and, you know, tries to meet that demand of what the customer has said. And that's how every big business should function. <laughs> so, yeah, that's great. We would like to take a minute to thank our sponsors. Our sponsor is Becca. Becca is a group of companies trying to make a big difference in the regenerative packaging domain. They focus on food packaging, food service, and food carry. This is where the biggest impact is created. So agave, bamboo, maybe bagasse, two questions in one. Uh, what substrates and what are the range of products that is going to come, say, in the next six months or has already come? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, that would be the hemp-based technology that we've developed. So utilizing hemp cellulose and converting that into, you know, bioplastic products. And so um, that's something that, you know, we're really excited about. We're able to do at a you know, relatively low cost to where we think we can actually compete with plastic at scale. Um, and so we're looking to launch that tech next year, which will allow us to go and make, you know, a wide array of products. So, you know, again, we, you know, we're happy with the food service products that we have. They're really great and we have great relationships with those manufacturers, but our goal has always been to make, you know, more products and we get that constant, again, customer feedback. Um, people want more. They want us to make anything from containers, lids, cups, to makeup palettes, to eyeglasses. We get crazy product inbound inquiries all the time because they love the straws. They love the forks. Bioplastics are such a unique thing to people. And I think a lot of consumers are just unaware that they're really out there and their quality. I still have so many people that I have to explain that we're not a paper straw, you know, so it's just such a new industry and, you know, that education is important and the ability to go into all these different product lines is going to really open up the floodgates of, oh, wow, we don't have to make plastic from petroleum anymore. And uh, so if you look at hemp itself, what is the prime focus and what does that fiber or your technology do that maybe bamboo or bagasse cannot the big thing for us that we really liked about that feedstock was the ability, well, first of all, sustainably, it's incredible. It's one of the highest carbon sequestering crops in existence. The ability to just kind of suck carbon out of the air and turn it into a plastic is awesome. Um, that's really big, really big plus and something that's going to be very important for us going forward. But additionally, that one of the things that was really interesting to me about that feedstock was as a result of our process, you know, we end up with this cellulose, but we also end up with some long fibers. And those long fibers can be used in other industries such as textiles or non-woven, as well as paper. And so there's a lot of really interesting applications. And I like the, the ability to use all of the plants is really interesting to me. And I think something that allows us to continue to diversify into those other revenue streams and other product streams. So that's one of the reasons that we really, really like hemp. In addition to it, you know, just being a really great, high cellulosic, really strong plant. So hemp again, hemp, uh, it's, uh, it's of course easy to say hemp because there's no one hemp. There's like 10,000 types of hemp. So, so do you know, is there a particular kind of hemp that you guys have identified for your products? Is there a region which you're looking at in terms of uh, manufacturing? And of course, the type of products that you plan to make from that fiber itself. We're using a fiber specific genetic. So it yields a lot of fiber per acre, three to four tons of, of fiber per acre, which is really solid. It's also more cellulose focused. So more, uh, you, you mentioned the bast and the herd, so you're familiar with the plants. So you, you know, it's a, it's a higher proportion of herd to bast, given herd is what we use primarily for the plastics. And so um, we're going to be in the North Carolina, Virginia area growing over there working with a lot of old tobacco farmers that are looking for a new alternative crop. So that's exciting. 
I think that's a great area and a great industry because those tobacco farmers, they know what they're doing. You know, that's, it's not an easy crop to farm. And so those are pretty talented farmers and um, it's nice working with them. So you mentioned the products. Um, I kind of touched on this with the cosmetics in the CPG space. So we've been working with some finished goods manufacturers as well as some direct brands to develop some products in those spaces. You know, I think that's something that, again, I'm just kind of over the moon about because it's been one of the things that I've wanted to do since I started the company was to make that whole portfolio of products and not just be in food service, albeit food service is fantastic, but the ability to make a razor handle or to make a makeup palette or to make a lid for a, you name it. That's something that I'm really excited to do and to work with more and more manufacturers as we launch that technology. And it's super interesting to hear you say that this is going to be U.S. located, so the supply chain is much easier. And is the manufacturing going to be something that you guys will look to get on your own, or would you look at co-manufacturers? Yeah, so I think a bit of both, and it depends on the product. You know, we will kind of utilize that co-manufacturing model um, that we've done to date because, you know, it's just lower risk and it's kind of gets you to a certain point and then once we get to that certain point of volume where it makes sense to bring it in-house, we'll, we'll do so. But, you know, we will be manufacturing that product that can go in and make those types of products with the other manufacturers ourselves. So um, the supply chain will be in-house for some of it, and then we'll continue to kind of bring different pieces of it in-house as the volumes and the numbers make sense. I also know that the whole hemp business went out mainly because the process of uh, separation of, of uh, the fiber was so difficult. Have you figured that out? How would you separate the fiber from the central shaft? Yes, yeah, that's, that's the tough question that you know has prevented that industry from scaling as fast as it probably should have given the quality of the fiber. It's, it's tough, that's something that we've spent a ton of time on. We've done a ton of work on um, that method and you know what we've landed on is you know decortication, you know, mechanical processes to you know, strip that fiber away from that inner herd at scale and to do it quickly. You know, that is something that we have figured out how to do. You know, again, we, we've done it at a small scale, so we're scaling that up commercially and that comes with its own challenges, but feel pretty confident about our ability to do that. That's super because, yeah, that'll give a, a glimmer of hope to a lot because uh, a sun hemp at least is a nitrogen fixative. So farmers in India would grow sun hemp in between the two crops that they would do in the year. And uh, they would then put it back into the soil. They use it as green manure because it's such a good nitrogen fixative. So they just turn it as and plow it with the uh, soil, and that gives them a better land for the next crop. Yeah, that's that's actually. I'm glad that you brought that up because that's another reason that we wanted to utilize hemp because we think that although it hasn't gotten there to date, it is very scalable because a farmer is incentivized to use it, right? If you use hemp as a cover crop, you're actually seeing higher yields the next year. You can use less fertilizer. Um, it replenishes the soil and all the good things that you just mentioned. So um, there's really no downside if you're a farmer to, to grow hemp in your kind of off year cycle. You make money from it. It increases your yield. You use less fertilizer. You make more money the next year. And it's kind of just a no brainer. Super. It's a, it's a great crop. And of course, I understand the more sustainable part, but you also said it's actually much stronger than a petroleum product. So so tell us more about that. Uh, and, and I presume you were talking more about the cutlery there. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's actually more on kind of the, the future generation of products. So that's the incorporation of those hemp fibers that we mentioned that, you know, have been used for like textiles. But if you get a much shorter hemp fiber, and then you use that as a essentially at filler for an existing petroleum plastic, you're going to increase the mechanical properties of that petroleum-based plastic while using less virgin petroleum. So that's something that I think is going to be huge in the transportation and logistics industries because to date, you know, a lot of the kind of filler additive to make it stronger has been a glass fiber. Um, and that is heavy, first of all, um, also somewhat expensive and you know, glass isn't all that sustainable either. And so the ability to use something that is actually lighter, stronger, and more sustainable as that reinforcement agent to make, you know, a structural type plastic um, is something that I think we'll see a lot of rapid adoption once that concept is kind of proved out at scale. So, of course, uh, congratulations on uh, raising your second uh, seed round earlier this year. 
and uh, I know that you're going to start scaling Plant Switch. So how how big is Plant Switch now in terms of how many people? And of course, uh, you're doing a numerous number of products. Uh, but uh, do you have quantities that you're already doing? And then what is the plan in the next, again, year or so? What is the kind of scale you're seeing? Uh, we raised our seed round last year. Uh, we raised three and a quarter million. So that was you know, obviously a big milestone for us. And so that's allowed us to scale the team up to about 20 people now. Um, we expect that that will probably double in the next year. We're actually raising capital again to commercialize and you know, make those new products that I mentioned. So we're in the process of our Series A right now. Um, that's been going pretty well, you know, hoping to have that done by the end of the year. And yeah, get that new technology up and running, uh, make those new products, work with these manufacturers that we've been working with. And then I think, you know, our capacities are um, likely going to be around eight to 10 million of pounds of throughput next year on these, on these new product lines. And then the facility that we're going to be making it in will have the capacity of around 50 million pounds until we max it out. So pretty good start. Um, and then obviously we will be raising additional capital. I mean, the goal is to really scale this thing and to really try to compete with plastic at scale. And I know that you've already been in the market and talked to, and you seem to be very, very connected to your customer. The other uh, thing that constantly comes up is the pricing. And I've heard you talk about the real cost of plastic. That's all good. You know, in the end, uh, the challenge is that the customer really doesn't look at it that way. And it's all good that the product is sustainable, but usually there's a, there's a certain percentage that people are willing to pay for it. So, so how do you see pricing for now and uh, going forward? What are the challenges? And do you see it becoming more and more competitive with the kind of processes you're developing? Absolutely. As I kind of mentioned at the beginning, you know, the big thing for me has always just been price. Um, you know, understanding that, like you said, that purchasing manager doesn't want to lose his job because he's trying to do something good. For him, you know, he doesn't want to go pay three to four times as much as plastic for sustainable bioplastic. And I, I won't mention any names, but probably know the price point that I'm referencing. So it's just prohibitively expensive for a lot of these corporations, which I don't think it needs to be. I think that if you approach the entire development of the technology from that cost standpoint, and you identify low cost inputs and low cost conversion processes, it's very possible to get to a competitive cost with plastic. On this new technology that we're launching next year, uh, we believe that will be about you know 40-ish percent more than plastic, which is great. And that's way more competitive than you know many of the things that I've seen to date. Um, and then we also have identified a lot of ways that as we continue, you know, bringing more of the materials in house and, and doing more of that development work that we can get into that 10 to 20 to 30 percent range of petroleum based plastics. That's something that I'm going to always continue developing until we get to that cost of plastic, because if you think about it logically, the raw material for plastic is petroleum, right, which has a fixed cost to it. But the cost for cellulose is not all that different. And the cost for starch is not all that different. And so you have these bio-based inputs that have been proven for bioplastics that are relatively low cost. And it's just a matter of you know, further innovation to be able to bring the overall material and the overall polymer, whether that's compounded or whether that's a virgin feedstock, into a range that is close to plastic. And I think it's just scale, right? You know, Everything is scale at the end of the day. And so the more that you can build a bigger facility and realize more efficiencies and bring more of your materials in-house, then the lower your cost is going to get. But I think if you look at it from just that pure isolated feedstock cost point, it makes sense that you can actually compete with plastic cost at scale. So I agree with you and I don't in terms of the comparison between, say, a cellulose starch and plastic, because if we look at the genesis of plastic, the plasticizers were a waste from petroleum distillation. Whereas when you're looking at cellulose, it's not. Yes, sometimes hemp, I guess, you know, you can call it a waste from some stream, but the majority of celluloses are coming from some sort of wood. And uh, it's not a waste. It is being grown for the purpose of timber or for cellulose and other usages. And the similar thing for starch. The biggest starches are coming from, say, corn or potato. So what I find challenging there is that the economics don't work the same. Yeah, it makes sense. But I, I think the counter to that is like, let's use hemp for it, for an example, right? So you isolate that fiber away from the inner bast, right? And that 
hemp fiber has a pretty high value on the market, right? Let's call it 90 cents a pound, which I think is pretty conservative. If you can get that hemp fiber isolated and then processed, you can process that at probably less than 50 cents a pound, and then you have really high margin at you know 90% sale point, right? Then that effectively subsidizes the cost of that inner cellulose that you've grown for the purpose of cellulose. So that w- if you look at it from that business model, then it really is a waste stream because you've developed that market for it. Um, so granted, it's pretty nascent, but also if you look at just the waste feedstocks across the globe, there's you know pretty readily available amount of massive feedstocks for you know scaling up. Granted, you're going to reach an inflection point where you run out of waste, which is a good thing. But if you're developing with the mindset of, hey, you know, I want to build something that in the next 20 years can compete with the cost of plastic and the way that I'm going to do it is the feedstock that I've identified has this basically monetary value to the fiber itself to where we can subsidize the cost of that inner herd and cellulose to basically nothing, then it makes sense. And you kind of have that same economics of what you mentioned with petroleum being a waste stream. Yeah, this is the first time, actually, I really appreciate your answer because this is the First time I'm actually hearing somebody talk about growing the inner herd for the uh, usage and the outer part being being the uh, co-product. So, of course, you have a different point there where the co-product is of very high value and you, then you get your product uh, as a waste. And, of course, um, in, my, in the business that we work in also, we convert a lot of gas, which is, of course, uh, a waste. So, 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 yes, you're right. And there's, there is a lot of other agri waste that are out there that can be converted. So yeah, thank you for that. So I also read that you're using different distribution chains in US. So I wanted to know more about your global presence and uh, and how how is it today and how are you building that for the future? We do work with some distributors in the Caribbean who have been fantastic clients for so far. You know, we are working to get into uh, the European market um, and we hope to be in the European market next year. Um, obviously, pretty stringent certifications, and so that's something that you know we've kind of been working on. Uh, in America, we work with a lot of the major food service, pretty much all of the major food service distributors, with varying degrees of involvement. Some of them have us stocked at many different distribution centers across the country. Um, some are acting just more of a facilitator with some of our larger clients. Some have us in some regions and not others. So it's kind of all over the map right now. Again, I mean, we launched two years ago. So um, we're still developing all of those relationships, but it has been a huge benefit to at least be approved vendors with all of them, because I'll tell you what, that first year of trying to play that chicken or egg game of, hey, you know, I want to service you and a client wants to buy stuff from us, but they want to buy from their distributor, which we're not in. And then the distributor won't carry us because they don't have enough clients was pretty difficult. So now we've gotten past that hump. And then that's when we saw sales really skyrocket because any client that we go to, we can pretty much say, hey, you know, we'll work with your distributor. We can get stocked in their location. And then any distributor we go to, we can say, hey, we've got, you know, 50 clients in your immediate distribution network. So carry us. Yeah, the U.S. distribution system is so complex. I'm also still figuring it out. Uh, So there was some other fascinating stuff on NYU's Endless Frontier Labs that you guys worked with, New Chip Series Accelerator Program. These are really fascinating cohorts that you seem to have been part of. And we have a lot of listeners who are startups, youngsters. We have a lot of listeners who are students and getting into the packaging polymer kind of domain. So it'd be great if you look at it from that angle and educate the listeners on what these are about and how they helped you scale and and build a plant switch. Yeah, absolutely. So we were pretty excited about... Um, getting into those two last month. So we just recently joined them and we're still kind of getting our our feet wet with them. But the Endless Frontier Labs was something that was really cool to me. You know, it's pretty selective program and, you know, they do their good diligence on kind of what the company is and what they're offering, what they've developed. And so um, we went through that approval process, admissions process and um, got in. Um, And I think we were, they picked 74 five total companies out of like 1100 plus applicants. So that was really cool that we got in, we got into the deep tech track. And so we had our initial meeting and it's just crazy hearing all the amazing startups out there that are working on these world changing technologies. You know, we've got people building rockets to Mars and people building planes that fly a foot over water for cargo purposes. And so 
Um, that's been a really cool thing to be a part of. There's just so many brilliant, brilliant founders in there. The Endless Frontier program helps with everything from fundraising to mentorship to even, you know, having an MBA student at NYU uh, work on projects for you. So we just recently got assigned our our student that we're working with and you know he's brilliant and fantastic and it's it's all free and it's non-dilutive and just a really cool program so excited to be a part of that i'm excited that we got in and really looking forward to kind of working with them over the next few months and continuing to get that mentorship get that fundraising help get all of those good things um, and then the new chip accelerator was another thing that was cool um, another pretty selective accelerator this one is definitely more on just the fundraising standpoint so um, I think EFL, the, the Endless Frontier Labs, is more of like mentorship and tech development and engineering and, and those types of things, whereas New Chip is pretty fundraising focused. And so it's been great. You know, there's a lot of great resources on investor materials, how to pitch, who to pitch to, how to manage the whole process. And so that's been very beneficial. And then they also have done a great job of just connecting us and making a bunch of warm intros with potential investors, specifically in the climate space. So um, both of those have been you know, pretty big helps, and I'm kind of looking forward to working with them even more since we've only been working with them for like two to three weeks at this point. So, Yeah, that's brilliant because I'm sure it'll give you so much insight into different aspects of business itself. So it's congratulations on both of those. Taking the conversation towards a conclusion, last two sort of directions or questions and if you can dream about, I'm sure you dream about this as any founder does, but uh, if you dream about Plant Switch for the future, uh, how do you see yourself in maybe a five-year period or a 10-year period, whichever one you like? Yeah, what, what would you like to have been your impact and how would you have contributed to this world? So this is something that I absolutely love what I do and I want to be in this for the next five, 10, 20 years. You know, I think Every founder says that at the outset, but I've given it a lot of thought and I just don't know what else I would rather do. This is just so purposeful. It means so much and it's such a cool industry to be in where I think a lot of the people in the industry too are just so collaborative. It's We, we all realize the scale. So it's it's not that competitive at the end of the day. It's like none of us are going to be able to service the whole market for the next 20 years. So we probably should collaborate. But to answer your question, you know, where I see Plant Switch is, you know, to me, success would be to just start seeing plant-based technology and the products that we use every day. You know, I would like to look at something that I touch every single day, like a, you know, a phone case or, you know, a keyboard. I'm just looking at things in my office right now, right? And, a, or a, a bottle lid or a cap, anything like that. And just know that it was made from our plant-based materials. Um, because not only would that be great for the company, but that's just a great thing for the environment and the world in general. So that's the mission. That's the goal. I want, you know, all the plastic that I touch to be made from plants and not petroleum. And I want to be the company that makes that happen. Super. And and you're absolutely right. We've had a few people, especially in the early stage startup kind of world, and they've said the same thing. It's such a collaborative space. And, and that's so wonderful to hear because that's how the world should be, right? There's enough for everybody, you know, just try and work with each other and there are more ideas that come along. So I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad that that's the way you see it as well. Uh, so the last question that I have to ask, uh, and, and we'd love to hear what people have in mind when we think about what is good garbage. What is good garbage? So to me, good garbage is something that can go back into the earth and not really be garbage at the end of the day. So thank you so much, uh, Dylan, for being with us, for sharing all the work that you're doing. Uh, throwing light on uh, things like hemp and uh, and agave, of course, and uh, the new ideas that you're coming in. So I wish you a lot of success and I hope Plant Switch keeps growing. Thank you so much for the work you're doing and thank you for being on the podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed this and, you know, really appreciate you, you doing what you're doing and getting the word of this out there. And, um, you know, just excited to continue our conversations as we go forward and, you know, hope we get to stay in touch. Thank you for listening to the Good Garbage Podcast. Follow us on social media to never miss an episode. Links are in the description below. I'm your host, Ved Krishna. See you next time.